From the studios of Cheshire TV in Keene, New Hampshire, it's The Men's Room, a show by men, about men, and for everyone. Sponsored by the Monadnock Men's Resource Center and hosted by Damian Licata and for Seymour. Hello, welcome to The Men's Show. If you've seen our show before, congratulations, you're a regular viewer. And uh, if not, uh, stick around. I hope you find something that's interesting. We talk about men, men's issues, masculinity. We're sponsored by the Monadnock Men's Resource Center. We are indeed. And, and the show's called The Men's Room, not The Men's Show. So but that's okay. Well, that's, that's right. That's right. It the is men, a show about men. But that's right. The okay. men's show has already been done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's passe. Yeah. Yeah. Men's room, though, it's new. Yeah, that's it's right. It's hot. Yeah. 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 So I'm Damien Licata. Forrest Seymour. Seymour. Yeah. yeah. And it's great to be here. Um, we are sponsored by the Monadnock Men's Resource Center. We'll talk a little more about um, the drop-in support group that the uh, MMRC offers. Uh, our, our URL to our website and our 800 toll-free number uh, should appear on the screen from time to time during the show. Feel free to contact us about the group or anything else about the show if you want to talk to us about that. And we, uh, I'm really excited about our guest. We have a great guest today. Um, but before that, I wanted to, this is our last show uh, before oh, the end of the 2006. year. 2006. 2006, right, right, end of the year. Yep. And I thought maybe we could talk for a minute or two about um, at least a story that I think is sort of really big uh, in regards to men and masculinity uh, from 2006, and that is the election. Uh, oh, absolutely. The, the November election, yep. yeah. I mean, I, I have a few uh, statistics here that I just wanted to, to read. Um, that that the uh, this con the, the incoming Congress, 110th Congress, has um, more women than ever before. 16 percent of the Congress is, is female. Um, the uh, the House Speaker for the first time is a woman, Nancy Pelosi. Here in New Hampshire, uh, we've had both sort of the uh, the what I think of as kind of the old school men, you know, male patriarchal kind of guys, Jeb Bradley and Charlie Bass are both out, you know, and in, and in and replacing them is a woman, Carol Shea Porter, uh, who, you know, just did an excellent job with an, a, a really clean campaign. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Hodes uh, replacing Charlie Bass, who I, I want to say, Paul Hodes, I, I heard him interviewed on the radio the other day, and he was like, um, he was tearing up on the radio, you know, in public, on the radio. In a way, you know, you think about uh, Ed Muskie, you know, I mean, right. that used to be, that you're been, out. That, you're that, out. that, that would have but been the end of his career. But here we have sort of a new man, you know, kind of, who's w willing to tear up on, you know, and he was talking about his grandparents and immigrants and all, you know, moving kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and I wanted to read just one um, quote from a column uh, that appeared in the New York Times. Uh, on November 11th, so just after the election by Maureen Dowd, and she wrote that this will be known as the year macho politics failed, mainly because it was macho politics by marshmallow men. Voters were sick of phony swaggering, blustering, and bellicosity, absent competency and accountability. Th they were ready to trade in the deadbeat daddy party whew, uh, for the sheltering mommy party. So I don't know how Democrats and Republicans feel about that, that characterization, but um, well, it's certainly interesting. I mean, I, they, and, and while, while you know, I mean, there was, a, there was a, an unusually high turnout for a midterm election this time mm -hmm. around. People mm -hmm. were, there was and more women, of, more women than men voted, 51% women. More women than men voted. Mm -hmm. More than 50% of the voters were, were women. Mm -hmm. yep, and yep. more than 50% of those women yep, yep. were um, actually voting voted for the Democrats. For the Democratic yep, yep, yep. Uh, ticket. Yep. So um, it's... Um, it's definitely been an interesting, I think there's, there's a, it sort of, uh, to me, indicates a kind of rejection. Maureen Dowd talked a little bit about this, yeah. but of this, of this sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of paternalistic kind of politics, the sort of male, um, yeah. you know, yeah. dominance right. kind of politics right. that we've right. been seeing yeah. in the last few years, particularly yeah. from the Bush administration yeah. and the Republican yeah. Party. Absolutely, the blustering, the, the sort of like, you know, macho, cal mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. the cowboy kind of stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. And like, I'd like to think that, that we're going to see the end of that or less of well, that. Well, I think, I, uh, well, well, time will tell. All right. Time yeah. will tell. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this is the, this is the, uh, the opposition's uh, uh, opportunity. 
and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, right, we'll hope right. that they can, can make the most of it. Right, right. So um, we don't have a lot of time. Yes, I right, think that on. another huge story this year, obviously, is the Iraq War. Yes. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that with our guest today. So great, great. And our guest, our guest I'm, I'm really proud and, and pleased to have on our show today Bill Beardsley. Uh, Bill holds a BA in psychology and religion and literature. He has a Master's of Divinity from Andover Newton uh, Theological School in Newton, Mass. He earned five years of postgraduate studies in psychodynamic and family systems theory and practice. He was ordained in the United Church of Christ in 1984 and served as a pastor and spiritual guide in churches in Massachusetts and New Hampshire for 22 years. Um, he is a pastoral counselor, certified as a fellow in the American Association of Pastoral Counselors and a member of Spiritual Directors International. He's been involved in peace and justice work f since a young age, starting in early in high school. During Viet the Vietnam War, he was an unrecognized conscientious objector, active in the resistance to the war. He's worked in many uh, social justice issues. He's currently the assistant director of Interface Camp Interfaith Campus Ministries and Club Outreach at, at Franklin Pierce College, and has opened a private practice uh, in Keene, uh, which he calls Renewal Counseling and Spiritual Guidance. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. It's great, it's great to, to be you. here. Well, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Yeah, that election, um, if anybody ever thought that we didn't have um, a say in local politics, I, I hope that we're waking up to that, and even national and yeah. state politics. Um, I'm very excited about it, but I think that we must be diligent in keeping these newly elected women and men uh, on their toes and true to what they campaigned on. I'm particularly concerned about the war uh, and, and other social issues that suffer because of the lack of uh, money that's available. It's getting sunk down a rat hole uh, in Iraq. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have great hopes. One of the things that, we've, that we talked about on this show fairly often is, is the, the idea of, of male perpetrated violence, for example. And I, I'd be sort of interested to hear what your thoughts might be about the sort of connection between, particularly in a time of war, but in general, I know that, that statistically there's more domestic violence in, in the military. It tends to spike before and after deployments of military units. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's this past rejection is in a sense kind of a rejection, uh, uh, the, this election is kind of a rejection of this um, a sort of culture um, of dominance and violence as a way of, of, of dealing with conflict and, and, and resolution of conflict. Mm. Do, you, do you see a, a connection there yourself in terms of, of you know, what, what does this mean? Is this a sea change? Do you think that there'll be a difference in, in a cultural shift around the whole issue of violence? That is my hope uh, that that's true. Um, I, I do think that there is a direct relationship to the uh, war-making apparatus and, and um, mis misguided muscular masculinity. Mm. You know, masculinity that hyper, that hyper masculinity. Hyper, sometimes yeah, uh, that that misses that we are our whole persons and that finds some kind of satisfaction and power and dominance and control. Mm to bolster whatever that picture is or whatever that illusion is of, 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 of what we are as men. Mm. Um, I've always been disconcerted by women's desire to be treated equally in regard to the military uh, mm -hmm. and to participate in the military. I'm a pacifist and committed to nonviolence, uh, lifelong commitment. Um, so that, you know, uh, and then war is trauma. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. w w it's not startling that the statistics show an increase in, in violence, uh, domestic mm -hmm. violence, uh, you know, after return uh, from, from war. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the return, uh, you know, the PTSD element to, you know, in terms yeah. of, of that is certainly, you know, understandable um, and maybe predictable. The interesting thing is that is that prior to deployment, there also tends to be a spike mm -hmm. before um, the the combat and traumatic experiences that often yeah. occur. Yeah, well, you know what occurs to me uh, just now as you say that I don't know if you've ever read James Baldwin's little little amazingly powerful book called Going to Meet the Man, hmm. where he makes a direct connection between I think between masculinity. Uh, 
sex, power, and violence. Wow. Um, it, it is one of the most stunning stories I have ever mm. read of a, mm. of a real working class guy who's a, a police officer and he, um, he's in bed with his wife and he, and he can't get it up. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about his day, having a cigarette. The more he talks about his day, he's talking about beating, uh, beating to a pulp a black man. This mm -hmm. is a, in, in South, a white officer. civil right, and white yeah. officer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and the more he talks about this perpetuation of violence, mm -hmm. the more uh, his testosterone mm -hmm. rises mm -hmm. and the more able he gets to a point where he mm -hmm. can finally make love with his wife, right. mm -hmm. or what he calls love. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Stunning, and now you know, the, and then move the, to the, a the clinical the eroticization of, of violence. violence, exactly, yeah. and yeah. it's yeah. everywhere. You yeah. know, it's everywhere, and you move to a clinical understanding of that, and there has been a a, a, a correlation between uh, violence and and sex, and the and, and the chemicals that get triggered by mm -hmm. both of those things, and how closely related they are. But what causes us to step to one side or the other is a whole other issue. Uh, one one thing, I mean, it took a woman to point this out to me so many years ago, and I'm very thankful that she sort of made this connection. But uh, you know, I, I I as I look at our society, I'm often puzzled by how. Um, uh, you know why are men? You know, so stepping back anthropologically, why do men uh, are they enculturated to be so violent in our society? Why is that? Why do we do that to men, to boys, to children? You know, and and the answer that I was was offered was um, to prepare them to to mm -hmm. fight mm -hmm. in the military, mm -hmm. to be the cannon fodder, to be to to sort of to to get ready for that inevitable war that yeah. our country or that our society is, is going to yeah. enter into, which, which uh, you know, is talking about a vicious yeah. cycle. You know? there, there's also this idea of men as protectors, and I think that that's part of, of what people were responding to after 9-11, and mm. one of the reasons mm. why um, that uh, the Bush administration and, and, uh, um, and other proponents of the war were able to be so successful in getting early support was because they, they they projected this swagger, this yeah. this hyper masculinity right. that triggered this idea of, of male protectors, and that that's yeah. what people were feeling some need for at that time. Well, and I think we're seeing how how sort of shallow that is. I mean, that only goes so far. And now we want something with substance, and you know, we want someone who can engage the world in um, in a meaningful way and you know resolve conflict. And the skills aren't there mm -hmm. because it's all about bluster. I wanted to ask you too, sort of a, you know, getting down to kind of the, the rather than you know the global politics down to the one-to-one -one struggles. I think you have done. Am I right that you've done some work around draft counseling? Mm. Not not recently so much, but historically. Well, even recently, um, and historically, uh, when Carter uh, invaded Iran back in the '70s, there was talk of of uh, reinstituting the draft, mm -hmm. and so we, both my wife and I are draft counselors and we brushed up on our, uh, mm -hmm. our uh, skills and whatnot. Uh, we even had a draft counseling center in uh, Newton, Mass. Uh, and then again, there has been talk along the way, you know, and most recently, yeah. Wrangell keeps, uh, the representative Wrangell keeps raising right. the right. Right. prospect of a draft. And I don't know if anybody caught it, but on the front page of the Keen Sentinel just uh, last week, I believe, selective service to do test run of draft. Uh, between now and sometime in 2008, they are going to employ the current structure uh, to see if it works. And I think it's important to understand that draft is the only thing that's gone away. The Selective Service has always right. had the structure in place and is always tweaking that structure, is always putting money into it, is always planning, is always strategizing. Young men are still having to register for the draft. Well, since, and, since and the we, 70s, right? Right. In the 70s, every, all young men have to register, mm -hmm. particularly college students, in order to get student, right. uh, student aid and that sort of thing. And because of the way that the military has changed, there is a, you can find this in Department of uh, Defense documents as well as on the Selective Service website, but you really have to dig. Mm -hmm. There is a plan, a potential plan, for what, what they are calling a skills-based draft. 
um, mm -hmm. because the, the military has gone so high tech right. uh, and there are, they need to draw from various populations in a way that they never have had to before because it's basically been a, a, a combat-based military. And, and they're so selective service the, would become more selective. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. They're, they're going to be and targeting particular skill sets. Yep, so and you would have to re-register every year and would have to add to your resume, so to mm -hmm. speak, any new skill sets mm -hmm. that you've acquired mm -hmm. in that time. Yeah, that's not going to encourage education, is it? No. <laughs> so if you're if you're a laborer, you know you, you, you're a skilled laborer. Yeah. That's there. If you're a, a computer technician, if you're me a medical, I understand medical, medical that, issues are big, and they already, I think, there is sort of a, a draft there going is. on for medical professionals. That's where the idea actually came from. Right. Uh, they've had a medical skills based. Uh, selection process for a long time. So what do you say to someone who is concerned about being called up um, or being not, well, someone who's concerned about being called up who maybe is in the reserves or someone who is not in the reserves but is looking ahead to a potential of a draft? What kind of, what do you say to, to, yeah, to yeah, I mean it's men and women but this is the men's room so I'm curious about what you said to men. Well this new idea is going to, is definitely going to include women but uh, if if you feel that you're a conscientious objector, it is not too soon to start the process from the point where you register. Even though they will not recognize your protest, it's suggested that when you register, you send in your registration with a protest letter and, and then send a copy of, of the registration and your protest letter back to yourself by certified mail. Mm. Hence begins the process of documenting that you are a conscientious objector. Now, there is room in the law also for selective objection. That's much more difficult to obtain to, and that's what we're, we're seeing, a, a tremendous rise in GIs who are saying, no, I'm a, I, 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 I object to this war. Uh, there's a GI rights hotline in the Center for Conscientious Objection, which has been around forever. Um, so, so are there are there websites? In, yes. Any that you could recommend? A couple you could recommend people. I would just say Google conscientious objection because I don't know the URLs yeah. off the top of my head, right. or GI rights, uh -huh. uh, and you will get a list. There's a lot of different things out there, but the. The long-term uh, organizations, the uh, Center for Conscientious Objection, um, NISBICO, which was a, n a national interreligious conscientious objector board, or right. still a facsimile of uh, that, the War Resisters League, all of these mm -hmm. groups have some sort of uh, mm -hmm. potential uh, counseling possibilities yeah, for, yeah. for people. But the, fir the GI Rights Hotline and, and the Center for Conscientious Objection are the two big ones, and they stay up on the law and try to keep people um, uh, in, the, in the loop in mm -hmm. the, what's happening there. Now, there, there is a, a fairly active local um, group um, around um, peace and uh, protesting of the war. Um, I think that most people have probably seen um, a few um, intrepid souls on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. um, on, on the square. On the square here in Keene, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, are you, is that something that you've been involved in, you know, those local efforts as well? Um, not necessarily the weekly vigil, although I show up there once in a while, and when I was living on the other side of the mountain, I would go to Peterborough. Um, but I am connected particularly with the wonderful organization called Mothers and Others United for a Peaceful World for Our Children. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the others. Uh, <laughs> <yep>. <laughs> uh, they're a phenomenal group of women who, who <laughs> they get an idea and they go for the idea and they don't, mm -hmm. you know, they don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about where are we going to get the money, how are we going to, you know, they've had two or three peace conferences. Um, one, one time we, uh, they, uh, we together were able to mobilize 150 people in a day to do a vigil on West Street um, uh, when the, I think it was when the death toll reached. Yes. I, I forget what I it forget was. The but moment, but then, I forget the moment, but I remember the vigil. I forget the moment. Yeah. 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 So, you know, they're around. Uh, there's a smattering of other groups that are around. Um, Quakers, historically, 
are always there, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I am uh, quite a, quite involved with. Uh, That's great. Them. Well, we're, we're we're on our list of people to invite, and we haven't yet. Is the founder of the, the Mothers and Others, mm -hmm. Mothers United group? Great. So I hope to have her on. Do you, so do you, um, I mean, what's your sense of how, of men's involvement with these issues? I mean, do you see, you know, are there, are there a lot of men out there? I mean, you, you, I mean the, the, the first organization on a local basis that you, you cite is a women's organization, although there are others involved there mm. too. But I mean, so do you see men being involved in, in uh, you know, questioning violence and challenging uh, the assumption that, that violence is a solution there? Yeah. Uh, I do. I, I see men, a lot of men, uh, particularly um, middle-aged uh, men and older veterans um, who are committed to living out an alternative to uh, violence and business as usual. Um, not as many as I would like to see. Um, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think that there is particularly uh, strong sense of that among, among people, you know, and a model for me of it is, uh, and, well, I'm just going to say it, Dennis Kucinich, uh, who's, who's a candidate for uh, the presidency. And so he's, he's running again. He's running again, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. He announced a number of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. he's being totally ignored as he was the first time. This is a man who there's no question, you know, I, I think there's nothing wrong with being a man. There's nothing wrong with being a woman, you know, and he takes his energy as a man and it's tempered by uh, his energy as a human being. And you go, you know, he's not only been the vo lone voice in the wilderness opposed to the Iraq war from before we went into it, but you look at his platform issues uh, everything from universal health care to, um, you know, stemming the tide of violence and hate to establishing a Department of Peace. Right, right. He has put legislation forth for years to do this. And there's a strong movement, uh, and you're going to hear other people picking up on it, too, I'm afraid. I heard, heard about it here first, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, who wants to institutionalize, which can be dangerous, but wants to institutionalize a Department of Peace that w yeah. whose sole purpose would be to look at alternatives mm -hmm. to violence and right. business as usual, mm -hmm. to train diplomats and mediators, uh, many of whom have already done training and are raring and ready to go, but they have no apparatus to right. function through unless it's through the UN, and that gets, mm -hmm. you know, truncated in a lot of ways. So, yeah, well, it, which, which makes a lot of sense, you know, to sort of counterbalance. And we have the Department of Defense, which was, mm -hmm. you know, used to be called the Department of War, and yeah. to have a Department of Peace makes complete sense. Yeah. But this whole question of us men and our violence uh, above and beyond war uh, is a really, really uh, critical and important one for mm -hmm. me, and I want to continue to work both through my therapy practice and, and through my political and social action to help mm -hmm. us along the way. And I think we need help along the way to find different paths to, to this. It, you know, a lot of it is learned behavior. Um, I don't think it's indigenous to men to be violent. I mean, you could take that perspective anthropologically and, and, and historically, do. and some mm -hmm. do, but I, I, it's just that that's consensus reality. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to consent to that reality. Yeah. Uh, but it takes reward a, violence behavior well, then, in many ways. Exactly. Yeah. And I was just going to say, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of courage mm -hmm. to break with that paradigm yeah. of masculinity and violence because yeah. there's not a lot of reward for it. I mean, there's an irony there, right? Because, it, because the... The, 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 the path that takes the most, most strength is the one of nonviolence. Yep. And the path of least resistance, the path uh, that is, is sort of just the one you can slip into and, and sort of just do, is the mm -hmm. one of, of violence, which looks like strength, which is how we define strength so often. I was reading about an interesting study uh, Cornell uh, graduate student just completed about um, um, what happens when men um, feel insecure about their masculinity. Mm 
I guess they were asked a series of questions and given immediate feedback. Well, this is yes, that's a masculine answer. That's a less masculine answer. Mm. That's a feminine mm. answer. Yeah. Um, and and um, and then who, who says that's a feminine answer? That uh, might be a masculine. The, well, the entire premise is obviously uh, uh, you know uh, for open to question, right. but he, it was intentional um, that they uh, give them this kind of feedback to see what kind of response these men would get. Oh, and so like they're being told, oh, that's a, you just answered in a feminine correct, kind of way. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, um, and the more insecure they became about their masculinity, the more likely they were to support the war in Iraq, to, mm. Um, mm. Be, to answer positively to wanting to buy an SUV, for example, <laughs> um, and things like that. And it's really interesting that our traditional ideas about masculinity, which are what men have had to go by you know, for, yeah. for ever, yeah. um, um, because they are so hard to move, um, and, and that finding replacements for these is, um, is causing so much anxiety. Right, well, and we have... The idea of redefining strength, for example. Yes, or, or you know, you comment about Dennis Kucinich, who is sort of like a different, a different kind of masculinity, to mm -hmm. a different model, right. and yet it gets ignored, because it doesn't, because why? I, you know, lots of reasons, but partly it doesn't fit into right. what people, you know, it's not, the, mm -hmm. it's not that macho politician yeah. kind of thing, and mm -hmm. so you've got this, this gentleman, and I, I, I've been in a room with him once, and. And he was a gentle and articulate and wise, smart guy, but not loud, mm -hmm. not a loud man. Mm. Although he could be on fire. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I haven't seen that side I of him. I haven't seen so. it. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. That's good to yeah. know. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, so, I, so uh, um, it's hard. It's, uh, as you say, I think it's really hard. I mean, I, as a father, you know, I, with a son, I, I often am feeling frustrated by how the models that, uh, that our society provides him, my son, are mm. uh, of masculinity, of manhood, mm. are pretty limited, you know, pretty narrow. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, we've kind of reached the point where we have to kind of draw this okay. conversation to a close. It's, right. it's, I would love to uh, continue this. Maybe you can come back and, and, and see us another time. I would love to, and I would love to just say that, that uh, there is a, on April 28th, uh, there is a, um, an event that's going to be taking place called the uh, Power of Nonviolence in an Age of Terrorism, it, probably in Hopkinton. Um, but if anybody's interested, you can get information from Who's sponsoring that event? these guys. Well, uh, the United Church of Christ Peace and Justice Task Force and New Hampshire Peace Action are collaborating okay. to uh, pull this off. And David Courtright, author of uh, Gandhi and Beyond Nonviolence for an Age of Terrorism, uh, uh, is going to be one of the keynote speakers along with Ali Perry, who is a woman who has given her life to uh, practicing and uh, writing about nonviolence, teaching nonviolence. So the New Hampshire Peace Action is one of the sponsors, is that what you, you yes. said? Yes. Yeah. So, so people could Google that, New Hampshire yeah. Peace Action, yeah. have a good Eventually. website. Eventually, yeah. And, and then there's the March on Washington and the last weekend in January to hold our people accountable. All right, all right. And also, we, last week, uh, Jeremy Yost was on and mentioned that you have, uh, uh, you're doing a workshop with him at the end of January. Thank we, you. Which we, we, got, we, we plugged that last week. So yeah, good. That's well, I'm glad. You get two shots at the end of yes. Yeah. yeah, well, we, we, we're very excited about that. We're offering this workshop for men uh, reclaiming the lost brotherhood and, right. and finding that, trying to find that balance within yeah. ourselves. That's great. Right. That's great. So, um, so we'll have you on again. Thank thanks, you. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, so we so another show wrapping up. I just want right. to be sure to say to our viewers that we have the drop-in support group for all men, a place to sort of carry on some of this stuff, some of this conversation. More of right. a conversation maybe about yeah. internal stuff, but but some of the right. same stuff. A place where men things. can get together and not worry about how they're being defined. That's uh, right. That's and, right. And they can try on a different way of being. That's right. And they can just sit and listen or, yeah. or whatever they want. That's at uh, 25 Roxbury Street in Keene, mm -hmm. right uh, next to Obishan's Hardware right. in the Life Art Center. Right. Life Art, very generously. Thank you very much. Life yes, Art indeed. offers that space for us every Sunday night. That's right. And yeah. it's at 7 o'clock, 7 to 9. And uh, we always ask people to get there a little bit early. So. Yes, we do. So uh, thanks, Damien, for... Uh, Thank for, you, Forrest. For yeah. being here again. Yeah. And, and thank you all for tuning in. Once again, I'm Damien Licata. I'm uh, co-director of the Monadnock Men's Resource Center. Forrest Seymour, yes, uh, yes, yes, also yes. co-director of right. the Monadnock Men's Resource Center. That's right. And a therapist. In town. In that's private true. practice that's right true. here in Keene. And we'll be back every week with another show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, folks.